Welcome to this lecture entitled, Using Historiography to Refine Your Research Questions into a Claim. Devising and refining a research question is the core of research design. Without a solid question, your research will likely be unfulfilling and pointless to you, even if you succeed in pleasing your professor or later, your boss. This lecture will introduce you to the techniques of taking the research question you've already generated and honing it by inserting it into the conversation you're having with other historians. We'll cover these topics. Why refine your question? An introduction to historiography. The idea of entering the academic conversation. And three practical things to do to make this lesson work for you. Finding, recording, and responding to the historiography you encounter. Let's begin with that basic question we all ask. Why bother refining your research question at all? It's a completely legitimate question to ask because you need to know the cost-benefit ratio of the time and effort you devote to this task versus what it's worth to you and what you can expect from it. The good news is that your research already devotes significant resources to gathering information from other historians. The process of refining your research question just asks you to gather slightly different information in a rational way. Then use that new information to make your analysis deeper and better. Furthermore, you do not have to completely refine your research question before you start gathering data. In fact, you will apply all of these techniques while you're gathering data. So, Let's answer the question. Refining your research question will improve your research design. Refining can point you in a better direction so you don't waste time chasing down rabbit holes of research that are fascinating but fruitless for the project at hand. Refining your research question focuses your gathering of sources. Put a slightly different way, refining your question makes your project manageable. Again, you have limited resources of time and bandwidth, and you have a deadline for producing a report. The process of engaging with other historians in addition to just lifting data from them will lead you to narrow your parameters to see what other people think is important about your topic or question so you can work with them rather than being left to your own devices. The answer to your research question will become your claim. For example, if you ask how and why did X event occur, your answer becomes your claim, I argue that X event occurred in this way and for this reason. Thus the process of refining your research question helps you to develop your claim. Refining your question also helps you make your research relevant. It's not just an empty exercise or a make work project. You have two audiences. The first is interested in your specific question. That audience is narrow and specialized. It's also easy because its members have enough background to fill in any blanks you leave and like you, they have invested enough to be interested in it. Your second audience is tougher. They're not specialists in your area of expertise, and they might not even know that your research addresses something they're interested in. But by engaging other historians through the process of refining your research question, you can put your research into the context of broader issues, as if it's a case study about those broader issues. Your audience is not everyone. In fact, Many times your audience is limited to a small fraction of a group of specialists or to your professor or boss. But I can say from experience that as a student, you're already interested in the bigger picture. 
you want your research to speak to larger issues. I actually have to hold some of you back in many cases, not because you're incorrect, but because you suddenly make too great a leap from your narrow paper into the larger issue that you hope it illuminates. But the process of refining your research question and get engaging other historians and their interpretations provides a bridge to speak from your narrow paper to the larger issue. The tool that I recommend you use to refine your research question and begin making your claim is called historiography. For our purpose right now, We'll define historiography as the interpretations of other historians concerning your research question or your topic. That is, what other historians think about the points you're trying to make. You can find this in the same books and articles, though maybe not on websites, that you've used to gather data that you plan to use as evidence for your own research. We'll examine this more thoroughly in a moment. You have two reasons to be interested in historiography. Later, you have to develop a section of your final research paper in which you report to your readers what other historians have written. We call that section a literature review, and you'll see a lecture on that later in the course. The second reason to be interested in historiography is that right now, it shows you the direction and limits of existing research. You've come up with a research question based on your own existing knowledge. Historiography, other historians' interpretations, lets you benefit from other people's considered experience also. Think of historiography as a map for a tour of your topic. Some historians have already surveyed the subject's topography, while others have already blazed a trail that you're following and, with luck, adding to. Like any other map, you can follow it closely, or you can start with it and blaze your own trail. But having that map sure beats the tyranny of facing an unknown land with only what you already know as your guide. The metaphor for engaging other historians' interpretations is entering the academic conversation. Imagine yourself at a party. You see a group of people talking and you want to join in. First you listen so you know what they're talking about, and then you take a turn engaging on the subject, then you respond to what they've said, but with your own interpretation of events. This is how you handle historiography intellectually and practically. By putting your own research question into conversation with other historians, you hone it and turn your research into analysis. Until you do, you're likely to stop short with just description and narrative, that is, telling a story. But when you respond to other interpretations by disagreeing, agreeing, or agreeing with a difference, then you've inserted your tentative interpretation into the broader topic, while simultaneously refining your question into something you can articulate more thoroughly. What we'll examine in our final slides are some ways to find those interpretations, to record those interpretations, and to respond to those interpretations that is, practical tools. Historical interpretations exist inside secondary sources. Interpretations are what secondary sources are all about, even though right now you likely use them to gather data only. By secondary sources, we mean what we would call history books and articles in scholarly journals. If you're unclear on the difference between reference sources, secondary sources, and primary sources. See the Types of Research Sources module, and for extra help locating these sources, see the Locating Secondary Sources module. But let me give you some shortcuts 
for finding secondary sources beyond those you already know about, like using those in an existing paper or those that you've used previously. Begin with scholarly articles rather than books because they're narrowly focused and more concentrated. Find these articles through the databases we subscribe to through the Troy University libraries. You have already paid for these. Most of you are familiar with the History Reference Center database, but expand that into JSTOR, which some of you probably already use, Project Muse, which some of you use, and ProQuest dissertations and theses. We'll talk more about this in just a second. Another database to consult for articles is Google Scholar. To get there, navigate over to Google Scholar, then type in your keyword search and check out what the system offers. When you're ready to look for books, check out the Troy Library Catalog first, then cruise through the various ebook databases if needed. Of course, Google Books is available. And many times, Google Books, even if it doesn't provide an entire book to you, will provide a book's introduction. The introduction might be all you need. Finally, when you find a work that suits you, mine its footnotes for sources or plunder its bibliography. Then track down those sources and see if you can use them. Now, let me say another word about theses and dissertations. I suggest you use these because students completing their master's degrees and particularly their doctorates spend a great deal of time working out their own historiographies. So they've laid the groundwork for you look for their literature review sections in their theses and dissertations, and it might be a distinct chapter, and see how they compare various historians who talk about the same things that you're likely to be talking about. When you find secondary sources, you're looking for the claims the authors write that they will support. An earmark of a more complex interpretation is the thesis statement. And more modern scholarship often includes markers like, this article argues that, and similar markers. Check out the Finding a Secondary Sources thesis module for more information about this. Regardless, the thesis statement, the claim that the source supports, the point that the author makes, introduces that author's interpretation, but the thesis statement is not the entire interpretation. One quick technique to find the author's interpretation is to employ the AIC reading method. AIC stands for Abstract, Introduction, and Conclusion. This works well for articles, particularly those that have abstracts. Abstracts are those summaries of the entire article that precedes the text of the article. So, read the abstract, then read the introduction, then read the conclusion in search for the author's interpretation. Why read the conclusion? Because sometimes an author doesn't fully articulate what they're trying to say until they summarize their entire article. Now, let's speak about books. Books don't usually have abstracts, but you can read book reviews in academic journals in place of those abstracts. Then read the book's introduction, not the preface, unless it acts as an introduction, and then read the book's conclusion. Once you've figured out the author's interpretation, capture it on a note card on which you've put complete bibliographic information. For this step in the past, I've used four by six inch note cards to capture the work's bibliographic information, its thesis statement, and an outline of the author's argument. When I want to take data or other notes from that work, I write up a note card as instructed in our module, Note Taking and Critical Thinking. Then I gather that information into an annotated bibliography, 
which is just a tool to get all of that info in one place arranged in alphabetical order by author. This will help you get a grip on what other authors are thinking and prepare you for both the literature review and the bibliographic section of your final paper. An annotated bibliography arranges all of your sources in a list, like a regular bibliography. But beneath each citation, you add a paragraph or less about the work's interpretation. If you're unsure about this, see the annotated bibliography module for more information. After you've done this, you've written a note card or two, you've written an annotated bibliography of all of your sources, then expand all of that by writing reflective memos for each of your important sources. This can be preliminary, but we will have an exercise that incorporates reflective memos as we move toward writing your lit review. A reflective memo is like an extension of the note card that we've just talked about. In addition to entering the bib information and the author's interpretation, you take it a step further by reflecting on that interpretation and articulating a response to it. We'll talk about responding to author's interpretations in just a moment, but if you want more information on reflective memos, see the module Engaging Resources Through Reflective Memos. For your reflective memo and later for your literature review, you must engage these authors by responding to their interpretations. Here you have three basic choices. You can disagree with the authors individually or in a group. You can agree with them individually or in a group or you can agree with a difference, which is much more common and is a lot more fun. Regardless of your choice, you have to articulate where you disagree, agree, or agree with the difference, and your reasons for disagreeing, agreeing, or agreeing with the difference. That articulating is hard, but Graf and Birkenstein provide you some templates to make it much easier to do so. You can find these in their text, They Say, I Say, The Moves That Matter in Academic Writing. Their templates lead you to use markers, that is, components of the templates, to report on the ideas of other authors and to respond in one of those three ways. This is complicated enough that I can't do it justice in this lecture. Please check out the readings I have signed for this module. Graf and Birkenstein's chapters are short, and it will get you moving quickly. Use their templates in your reflective memos because it's there that you will present both sides of this emerging academic conversation in which you have become engaged. So let me summarize. This lecture instructs you and provides some basic tools to help you hone your research into something you can answer in the short time we have and to move you toward articulating an answer that will become your claim. The first basic tool is to engage the interpretations of other authors so you can see the existing limits of current scholarship on your question or topic. By engaging these other interpretations, you change your simple narrative or descriptive question into an analytical one. You will add to scholarship and tell us what larger import your answer will provide to your question. It's no longer about telling a story, but telling us what that story means in the larger history. We call those interpretations historiography. And when you engage that historiography, you enter the academic conversation with those historians. First, you see what they have to say. Then it affects how you see the issues you want to raise. Then you put in your two cents worth. Next, this lecture discusses some rudimentary methods for finding articles and books with historical interpretations. That is, check Troy Library databases and Google Scholar for article, check the library's catalog, ebook databases, and Google Books for books. You can also mine the footnotes and plunder the bibliographies of secondary sources you're already using. Remember, too, that another fruitful source for historiography 
that is a complete discussion of what author authors think are theses and dissertations either directly on or adjacent to your topic. You can find these in the ProQuest dissertation and theses database. After locating interpretations, record them on note cards, then in annotated bibliographies, then in reflective memos in which you engage them. Engaging them means responding to them by disagreeing, agreeing, or agreeing with a difference for each source. Graf and Birkenstein's textbook, They Say, I Say, offers great templates for making your engagement much easier. Doing all of this will solidify your thinking, put your research question into the greater flow of historical study, help turn your work into something more meaningful and analytical, and help you tell us why your work is important, which it is, but you have to tell us why and how. This then ends the lecture, and as always, thanks for your attention.